Uh, Jim, this is our 375th year here in Portsmouth, and you're going to be doing a series of lectures on Portsmouth history. What are kind of your objectives in this whole program? One of the big problems is that nobody else in Portsmouth is writing history, and, and I feel it's very important to get the word out that we have a very rich, very wealthy history. And I've done six books on local history, and I think it's important that we uh, that, that we honor a lot of the different subjects. I've, I've covered a small portion of it with six books. There's so much more. And I just think that they, they hopefully this will stimulate people to get involved, to get interested, and hopefully we'll get some more writing going on. And I, I think uh, the, the fact that it's our 375th year may spur some people to read more books and, and le learn about Portsmouth history. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, it's a really good opportunity for that. Okay, thank you, Jim. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. In celebration of Portsmouth's 375th birthday, this lecture is presented in conjunction with the Portsmouth RI 375th Committee and Portsmouth Free Public Library. Tonight's guest speaker is James Garman. Mr. Garman is an author and retired Portsmouth Abbey history teacher. This is the first of several local history talks that Mr. Garman will present during the year. His topic tonight is the founding of Portsmouth. So let's all welcome James Garman. Thank you. Thank you. Here we go again. How many of you were at the ceremony at noontime today? Just out of curiosity, how many were there? Good, quite a few of you. So you got to see the compact. Yes. It's really exciting. It really was. I got all teared up looking at it. I was amazing. <laughs> so. Okay, what I'm going to talk about tonight a little bit for those of you who were here this morning is a little, much more elaborate than what I uh, uh, talked about this morning. What I have is a slideshow that uh, will show you a few things. Obviously, they didn't have photography in 1638. Uh, they didn't have it until 1841 in the United States. So. We have some sketches, a few things like that, and we have lots of words. I tend to put too many words in my PowerPoints, but that's, you have to live with that, I'm sorry. I try not to read them if I can help it. Okay, a few important questions about Portsmouth. How did it get settled? How did the town get here? Who were the first settlers? Um, where did they come from? And what was the compact and why did they create it? Was it necessary? Was it an essential document? Or was it something just sort of cool to do in 1638? And why do we celebrate today on the 375th anniversary of its creation? Uh, it was very exciting to see, and I think Doug made a really good point this morning that, that this document's 140 years older than the Declaration of Independence. I, that's really impressive. We only had it for the noontime, however, because it had to go back to Providence under police escort and get back in the archives. So, we have pictures. Okay, the three major personalities in the settlement of Portsmouth. Quite disparate characters as we have here. Uh, first we have William Coddington, second as everyone knows we have Anne Hutchinson, and we have Reverend Dr. John Clark. These were the three most important people in the settlement uh, that came here to Portsmouth in 1638. I'll talk about each of them at some length as I go through this. Also involved in our settlement here, however, was Roger Williams. As you may or may not know, Roger Williams was booted out of Boston as well, uh, banished from Boston, and uh, decided he would come to uh, a new settlement. Roger Williams got along very well with the, uh, with the Indians, and I use the word Indians instead of Native Americans. I apologize for anybody who's offended by that, but Columbus called them Los Indios, so I'm going to call them Indians. It's a lot easier to remember. Roger Williams came to uh, what was to be, become Providence in 1635. Uh, he had been chased around uh, different parts. He had been criticized. He criticized. He was a minister of the Puritan Church and he criticized other ministers and uh, made a reputation for himself. He eventually went to Salem. He was in Plymouth for a short while and then back to Boston and then finally in Boston they didn't really like his politics so they decided he would be better off somewhere else. Okay. So he, was, he left Boston in January of 1636. Again, his crime uh, in terms of his banishment, writing letters full of anti-Christian pollution. That's actually the words that were used at, at the time. And when he came here first, he settled on the, um, the east side of the Seekonk River. And uh, they found that that was a problem because he was still in Massachusetts. <coughs> so he crossed the river and settled what be has become Providence in 1636. Um, 
And, and one other thing you have to keep in mind too is that the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the claim of that Massachusetts Bay Colony came to the Sakonet River. So what we call today Tiverton and Little Compton was part of Massachusetts and remained part of Massachusetts by the way until about I think it was 1746, 47, around there sometime. Okay, so Williams got along, as we all know, I think from the mythology that has followed his name, got along very well with the Indians. He had friends that, with the Narragansetts, he uh, negotiated with them, he treated them very well, and, and he got along uh, quite well with them. The two leading sachems, or chiefs, of the Narragansetts were names that are familiar to us, of course, uh, Miantinomi and Canonicus. Those are the two major uh, leaders of the Narragansett uh, Indian tribe. And their headquarters were over more or less in, in this vicinity today of, uh, of South Kingstown, North Kingstown, and, and Narragansett itself. So that's the area where they were um, settled. And again, Roger Williams got the land from them uh, in exchange for kindnesses and services. That actually was part of the deed of, that Roger Williams negotiated when he but got Providence. <coughs> Williams is very important in his writings because he believed strongly in the idea of freedom of religion. That people could worship whatever God they wanted and, and, and he was very tolerant of that. And that was true in Providence and it ultimately came, became true in, in Portsmouth as well. Um, that, the concept of freedom of religion was something very different because what we have to understand is that in Massachusetts they had the kind of government they had was called a theocracy. A theocracy means that the whole government is based on on God, on the Bible, on Scripture. And that the most important people in the Massachusetts Bay Colony were the ministers. <coughs> Harvard College was established in 1636 to train Puritan ministers. Okay. One other thing just to sort of keep in mind background wise as well is that Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth were different colonies. They eventually unified in the 1680s, but at this time, in the 1630s, they were separate colonies. The people had come to Plymouth in 1620. As I said this morning, they stepped on that rock that had 1620 carved in it so they knew where they were going. <laughs> and they um, established the, the, port, the Plymouth colony. Boston, or what became Massachusetts Bay, was established a few years later, eventually in uh, 1630. So that was a little bit later. So what we deal with in some cases here, especially as we get opinions being voiced by, by various governors of, Ann, of what they thought of Anne Hutchinson, we get some from Plymouth and some from Boston. So um, they really equally denounced her. So Anne came to Boston in se September of 1634 with her husband, Will. Now, Will, as a, a personality, was, uh, let me put it this way, as a, as a uh, merchant, was very successful. He was, he was quite well off. Um, but he wasn't a strong individual. It would be difficult to be a strong individual married to Ann Hutchinson. Um, but he sort of went along uh, with, with a lot of things. Boston, as it, at that time in 1634, looked like this. This is the map. Uh, we, we really, it's hard to conceive of Boston being like this. There's been so much fill put in Boston uh, to expand the land. This is downtown Boston. Um, I didn't bring my, oh, I do have my pointer. But, but the, the common is over on the left-hand side there. There was a Boston common at that time. Uh, but this was the whole town, if you will, of, of Boston. And, and that's where many of the settlers coming into the New World, many of the immigrants coming into the New World, um, settled. Okay, so again, uh, it was a theocracy. It was very rigidly puritanical. That word came down to us a, for a long time. Um, as I think most of you will probably remember, there were, there were years, I, I probably into the 1970s, where a lot of stores in Massachusetts couldn't be open on Sunday. Uh, because of the puritanical laws that go back to the 17th century. Um, so what happened then in, um, in Boston was that Anne began to gather at her home a number of people who had similar ideas, similar interests, and um, 
she would dissect the, the, the sermon that the minister had preached the previous Sunday. And they would talk about um, you know, whether he was right, whether he was wrong. The whole religious thing in, in Boston is very complicated. Uh, Anne led an organization that, that came to be known in a critical way as the Antinomians. And I won't go into all the details here because it's, it's not really germane to the settlement of Portsmouth, but essentially the big argument was whether or not a person is, is determined to be a saved person, to have salvation by their works that they do or simply by grace. And so that, was, that became very complicated and very critical in the discussions and the criticisms of Anne Hutchinson. So she had, one of the people who was a strong supporter of her, interestingly, is uh, Henry Vane, who was elected governor of Massachusetts in 1636. Also, John, Reverend John Wheelwright, who was her brother-in-law, and William Coddington and others. I just want to say one thing about Coddington at this point, and you're going to hear more about Coddington probably than you are Anne Hutchinson tonight. Coddington was the wealthiest man in Boston. He was so wealthy that, that they actually are colonial records that say he lived in the brick house. He was the only person in Boston who had a brick house. Um, so he was a very wealthy man. Okay, keep that in mind. So these people became followers, if you will, or, or just supporters of these discussion groups that Ann Hutchinson had after, um, after, you know, on, on the Monday night after the Sunday sermon. After the Sunday sermons, they spent about six hours in church on, on Sundays. Okay. Now her critics, John Winthrop, very much was a critic as you'll see as I go through this. The Reverend John Wilson was the minister of the main Puritan church in Boston. Uh, he continuously uh, criticized her and ultimately uh, helped bring a significant amount of testimony at her trial. Again, a theocracy. The political leaders were pretty much subverted to the religious leaders. They, they worked together. They were, they were separate. There were governors who weren't ministers, but they, they really kind of uh, worked pretty closely together. And that's really hard. When you think about it, a lot of the people that came to Massachusetts Bay, a lot of the people that came to British North America, came for various dissident reasons. Now all of a sudden you come to Boston, you have to accept the Puritan church, you have to you know, make sure you're in church all that time on Sunday, you have to follow their rules, follow their laws. And I, I, I hope this doesn't need to be said, that, that women were very much in a subservient position in that kind of a society. I think we're all pretty much well aware of that. And Hutchinson didn't sign the compact. Okay. Um, okay, so there was criticism of her from the establishment, if you will, but meanwhile, more and more people are pouring into Boston. The Puritans came in large numbers in Boston between 1630 and 1648. We refer to this some as the Puritan migration. And the reason for that is that the Puritans were driven out of England. Under the uh, administration of King Charles I, James I and then Charles I, um, the, the Puritans were criticized because they challenged the Church of England. And many of them were, were allowed to, many of them were forced to emigrate somewhere else. And some went to the Netherlands and some came to the New World. Okay. Uh, but so you had this, this rather bizarre collection of dissidents who came to the New World. And then you, if you come to Boston, make sure you accept all our laws and all our rules and regulations. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you think about the motivation for these people coming. So it, it was inevitable that there was going to be dissension in Boston and inevitable that uh, you know, they, they really tried, the Puritans really tried to hold on to it tight. And, and the main punishment that they had for people was banishment. If, if, if you don't like the way we're doing things here, move on. We've heard that before, haven't we? Uh, so the idea being that we'll take you out of our environment and then we'll preserve our pristine environment and keep it the way it was and we won't have to worry about your criticism. Well, as time goes on in 1636 and 1637, a number of these followers of Anne Hutchinson were banished from the colony. Uh, it's kind of an interesting uh, combination. They were banished and they were disarmed. Well, they were disarmed first, I suppose. Uh, their guns were taken away from them and then they were banished. And Coddington, Wheelwright, and a lot of others were, were subjected to that. 
Okay, so, whoops, there we go. Ann Hutchinson was brought to trial. She had two trials in 16, 1637. Uh, the first was a civil trial, and the crime that she was charged with was traducing the ministers, meaning slandering the ministers, criticizing the ministers. Uh, Ann Hutchinson, as you probably know, was a very strong woman, a very um, edu well-educated woman, a woman who stood up for what she believed, and, and, a, and a very admirable, admirable person. But she didn't fit into the Boston society. There were problems, and, and again, just simply the fact that she was a woman. And so she was convicted in her civil trial, and she took a strong stand for her beliefs, and yet she lost, and she was banished. When they banished people in Massachusetts, what they often did was say, you're banished, but you have to be out of the colony by three months from now. It wasn't like you have to go tomorrow. Okay? They wanted to keep Ann Hutchinson around for a little while because they had another trial in mind, and that was a religious trial by the ministers. So she had two trials. The second trial, she uh, was convicted as well, and the banishment was moved up a little. So she really had to get out of, the, out of Massachusetts Bay. She also, while she was waiting to leave the colony, she was put under more or less house arrest a couple of miles away from her home. Her home was in more or less downtown Boston. She was sent all the way out to Quincy. And uh, she was forced to be there without her husband and without her 15 children that she had at that time. She had 17 altogether. Everybody's descended from Ann Hutchinson, right? <laughs> There's so many people in this town that are, it's amazing. Okay, so meanwhile, a group of these dissidents got together and said, where are we gonna go? You know, what do we wanna do? And so they, they gathered together, again, mainly followers of Ann Hutchinson. We don't really know if she was involved in this, probably not, this was probably when she was under house arrest. Um, and a group, began to look around for where to go. Now keep in mind, as these colonists came to Massachusetts or they came to any other colony, it all of a sudden got too crowded on the coast, so, well, let's go inland a little bit. Let's see where, we can, where else we can go. Obviously, the possibilities were endless as to where they, where, where they could settle. When you think about it, of course, they didn't have too much of an idea that California was 3,000 miles away, but you know, let's just go over the next hill and maybe we'll find better farmland there. Maybe we'll find a better, better environment there for what we want to do. So a group got together, a group of dissidents, more or less followers of Ann Hutchinson, and one of the leaders was John Clark. John Clark's a fascinating person in this whole story. He was a minister. He ended up fi uh, founding the first Baptist church in Newport. He was also a physician. He also, at this time, and I think this is really an important consideration, he was 28 years old. He was young. John Clark, like Roger Williams, believed in the idea of religious freedom, religious liberty. And, and that's his main claim to fame. And you're going to see a lot about John Clark. There's now a John Clark Society in Newport, and there's a, a biography of him being written uh, by Mr. Worm, Worm, Wormer. And that's, that's going to be all to the good in terms of his reputation. So they decided where they would go, and they th considered the idea of going to New Jersey. All these places were settled, but really primitive settlements, uh, and Delaware and Long Island. But then they got in touch with Roger Williams, and Roger Williams says, I know a place you can go. I know a couple places you can go. One is Soams, and the other is Aquidneck. Okay. Soams is what later became Barrington. Aquidneck, I think we know where that is. So they checked out the both of them, those two places. And on the 7th of March, 1638, 375 years ago today, they signed an agreement. And the agreement primarily was an agreement to band together, to work together for some type of a, um, um, a, a, a settlement, okay? They probably, and again, there's no verification of this, they probably created this document in, at William Coddington's home, which was one of the biggest homes there, and it probably was written by the Reverend Dr. John Clark. 
Uh, the reason we speculate that, and other historians have speculated that as well, is that there are a lot of religious references to, the, uh, to, to God and the scriptures and so on in the Portsmouth Compact. And again, we were so fortunate, a bunch of us, to see that document uh, this morning. And it's just incredible to, to see it. And, uh, and, and I've been on Portsmouth history for about four, almost 40 years, and, and that was the first time I had seen it, which was, I almost cried. <laughs> uh. Okay, and here's the document they created. Again, this is the text of the document we saw this morning or this afternoon. And let me, before I read it, let me, let me just say one thing. There's a precedent for this. And the precedent probably is, uh, was known to these people who were writing this compact. That precedent was called the Mayflower Compact. And the Mayflower Compact was, was written in 1620 when the settlers who were coming to, uh, to Plymouth ended up coming to Plymouth. They weren't sure where they were going. When they stopped out on the edge of the Cape and moved along on the inside of the elbow of the Cape, they signed an agreement which in their case was mainly for protection because after all, they were supposed to be in Virginia. They were a little bit out of their, their claim that they had been given. So they were uh, a little bit on their own. They were concerned about the possibility of being able to have a settlement. They ultimately were concerned about the possibility of, of uh, attacks from Indians. Anyway, so they signed the Mayflower Compact, and I'll, I'll talk about the similarities after I, I go over this. But one of the really amazing stories, think about this. As far as the Plymouth or the Mayflower settlers were concerned, was that they came ashore at Plymouth, and all of a sudden there was an Indian there. And there's another one. Up on the hill there were a couple more. And, you know, they all loaded their blunderbusses that they had and got ready for to fight their way into the into the area. And one Indian approached them. He was not armed. He looked them in the eye and he said, welcome. Which shocked them. He said it in English. Okay. So Squanto, who had been captured earlier by John Smith, taken to England as a slave and worked in, sla uh, in slavery in England and somehow, and nobody knows, got his way back to his people. Amazing story. I think that's very incredible. They must have dropped their teeth about the time they, he said that. Okay, so they had the Mayflower Compact, 1620. This is the Portsmouth Compact, 1638. They're different. There, there are similarities and there are differences. Let me read this and then I'll show you each of those. We whose names are underwritten do here solemnly in the presence of Jehovah incorporate, and the spelling, by the way, is as it was there. I don't, and and my, my spell check went crazy with some of this ourselves into a body politique, and as he shall help, we'll submit our persons, lives, estates unto our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of King and Lord of Lords, and to all those perfect and most absolute laws of his given us by his holy word of truth, to be guided and judged thereby. The seventh day of the first month, 1638. I'll talk about the calendar in a minute. There also are three biblical quotations on the side of the uh, compact, just the, you know, second kings, whatever it was, and so on, without spelling them out what they were. All right, now the main difference between the Mayflower Compact and the Portsmouth Compact is that the Mayflower Compact makes strong reference to the fact that we are going to, you know, in, 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 I'll uh, interpret this, we have been given this colonial charter by King James I, and we are going to organize this under the king. Okay. The Portsmouth Compact has no reference to any kind of you know, monarchical authority. Okay. So they weren't, you know, they weren't, uh, what they were trying to do was escape from Massachusetts Bay. Okay, that's where they were trying to escape from, and they didn't really want to put that in their compact. So what they're doing is they're agreeing to band together. This word, this phrase, body politic, in the Mayflower Compact, it says civil body politic. Uh, same phrase, odd phrase. Uh, what does it mean? Well, it means that we're going to work together. We're going to, you know, nobody's going to be able to go off on their own. We're going to stay together and, and work together. That's essentially what it means. But here, again, all the religious references, okay? And we pledge our, or we submit our persons, lives, and estates unto our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, etc. And the, uh, the absolute laws of His given us by the Holy Word of Truth to be guided and judged thereby. It's a religious community. They're setting up religious, a religious basis 
for their colony. There's no mention of any kind of uh, civil authority other than we're going to work together. Now, as far as the calendar goes, I won't get into this. This is really complicated. But the, there are, in, in 1638, there, in this area, there are three calendars. We have the new style, the old style, and the equidnic style. Okay? And they're all different. And, and that's why until, I think it was something like 1752, we had new style and old style. Um, I, I do a lot of Russian history and, and studying and, and teaching and so on. And in Russia, you have the October slash November Revolution, and you have the February slash March Revolution, because the calendar they were on was 13 days different. They finally, in the 20s, decided to join the rest of the world. But the Gregorian and Julian calendars were, were separate and had gone, it has to do with uh, leap year and, and things like that. It's very complicated. But anyway, we had this other separate calendar for here. And it didn't really match either one. So sometimes you'll see 1637 slash 1638. And March was considered by them to be the first month of the year. And so that's why this absolutely is you know, the anniversary of this. It was March 7th that they signed this. Okay. So the significance of this is very important. It's important because, and, and I won't go quite so far as some historians have gone and say that, um, that this was the first Declaration of Independence. I don't think that's true. Um, but I think it's, it was a matter of, we better band together or Massachusetts is going to come and get us. Okay? And they lived in that, with that fear for a long time. Anne Hutchinson migrated from Portsmouth in 1642, partly because she feared Massachusetts coming and getting her even that late, after they had been here for, uh, you know, for four or five years. So, th but the compact is important and it's significant and it's just incredible to look at it and see this document 375 years later. <coughs> and it was, uh, I, it, it's in parchment in a, in, a, in a book. And I was really impressed by the, the condition of it. I thought it was really pretty good shape. Amazing. Okay. So after they signed the compact in Boston, Probably, okay. Very likely it was signed in Boston. They decided we gotta find a place to go. So they went to Providence, they went to Plymouth, they went, uh, came to Aquidneck Island. Aquidneck, as you probably know, was the Indian name for, for the island. Uh, and they finally, with uh, the help of Roger Williams, went to the Narragansett country to talk to uh, Miantonomi and uh, Canonicus. They were the two chiefs of the Narragansetts who controlled really uh, this whole area, the islands as well as a lot of the mainland around. There was another individual who was in, in charge of the Narragansetts on this island, and his name's pretty familiar to you as well. That was Wanamatonomy. Okay, so he was under Canonicus and and uh, 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 Miantonomi. The Indians agreed, and they used the, the word quidneck spelled that way, uh, to a they agreed for a deed to exchange the island, the control of the island. Again, this is largely as a favor to Roger Williams, because they didn't know who Coddington and these people were, but they knew Roger Williams well. And the price that they got the island for was the full pay, and this is a quote, the full payment of 40 fathoms of white beads to be equally divided between us. That is between the Indians, okay? 40 fathoms of white beads. The value of that, who knows? But I'll bet it's less than $24 for Manhattan. Got it pretty cheap. Okay. Now, there was an addendum to the deed, which was signed by Miantonomi, and he got 10 coats and 20 hoes, garden hoes, if the Indians, they shall remove themselves from off the island before the next winter. That's kind of a bonus, okay, on top of the, uh, the actual price of the island. That was a bargain, too, I guess you could probably say. Now, on the way back to the Narragansett, it's an interesting sidelight, and I don't know why this made it into the history books, the early history books, but it did. Uh, William Dyer, who was one of the, the important people in the colony, um, and, and his wife became much more important than, than he, uh, and, and ultimately was, uh, was executed on the green in, or on the common in Boston because she, of her, uh, her Quaker beliefs. They became Quakers later. Uh, anyway, they went by Dyer's Island, and, and some of you might know where Dyer's Island is, some of you might not. It's a little island off Melville. And uh, 
William Dyer said, I, I, I want to own that. And so they, they gave it to him. There's actually a small deed that says he's given that island. For what? I don't know. So they decided that they would make a settlement on the northern part of the island. That was the direction that they, where they wanted to go. Uh, they considered the farmland was better. It was relatively flat. Um, and we have to keep in mind that the primary entrance that they had onto this island was what we call the town pond. The town pond, for modern times, I don't like to use this reference, but anyway, it's in the backyard of the Roger Williams Conference Center. Okay? It's a big pond that's there that was recently renovated about four years ago by the Army Corps of Engineers. And that was the main route into Portsmouth. Think about that. In some cases, they came, when they came from Boston, they sailed past Newport Harbor and came to the town pond. It's a little bizarre. You think about it. When you look at Newport as a, a natural harbor, it's unbelievable. It's really very much so. So that's where they decided to come, uh, in the northern part of the, of, the t of the island. This is a copy from um, Eve LaPlante's book on American Jezebel, which is a biography of, of Anne Hutchinson and her struggles. It's a book well worth reading. Uh, it's a book which has an enormous amount of information about her trials in Boston, not a whole lot about her life in Portsmouth. Um, I worked with Eve a little bit when she wrote this, and Eve is coming in, uh, I think it's October, and she's going to give a, a lecture uh, on Anne Hutchinson over at the Abbey uh, for the public. Um, that's part of our, our scheduled events that we have set up already. She's agreed to do that. <coughs> Okay, so where do they settle? What you have here is, you can see the town pond right here. It was open to the water. It, it isn't now because of the railroad tracks that go across there. Uh, but it was open and they came in, and primarily they came in almost as far as they could go, down to this end of it, right in here. And that's the area where we have the memorial to the founding of Portsmouth that nobody can find. We have the Anne Hutchinson Herb Garden there as well, which is a memorial to her. We have a plaque which includes the compact on it. I'll tell you where it is. It's not really a secret. You have to go by Mellow's Farm down on Boyd's Lane and sort of turn like you're going to go into this front yard of this house right there, park your car there, and then walk to the right. It's a beautiful little spot. Uh, it was dedicated in 19, interestingly, in 1936, because in 1936 we had all sorts of um, uh, ceremonies in the state because that's the the 300th anniversary of the state and so they did a lot of things all over the state that year I have a number of books and, and photographs and so on from it um, I'll tell one tale there were the, the, they were dressed up in colonial costumes a lot of them in uh, and there's this one little girl who was sitting on the founders the stone where the at founders brook bawling her eyes out and I found out who that was and I asked her if that was her, and she said yes, she remembered that uh, she had cried that whole day for some reason. She was about four or five, I don't know, maybe less than that. Uh, anyway, that was Andal Bayesian. She was, she's still with us. Anyway, it was kind of funny. She said, how'd you find that? <laughs> and a lot of things. Uh, okay, so anyway, this is, this is where they settled. This, you have on this map, there's a key here, which is kind of hard to read, but the Hutchinsons were here which is, which is probably about where the, the gravel pit is there, the machinery down the gravel pit there. Uh, a lot of things were, the training ground is over here. This is where the Memorial Park is, again, by Mel behind Mellows there. Uh, and you have numbers of house lots. Coddington was number three, he was there, and some of the early settlers. This, this is a really good map that shows, and it's taken from that book, uh, it shows where the early settlements were. Okay. And I think that's, that's really, an important indication. So they had, they had two and three acre house lots around the cove, around that area, and then they could purchase land beyond that. And in most cases, the farms that they had among the original settlers, most of the farms they had were two and three hundred acres. And went, as far as I can tell, as far as Wapping Road. Okay. Uh, so all the way down through the town. We had a fellow in, in 1938, and I, I don't know what happened. I, I recently found out where he came from. He came from Fall River. His name was uh, Edward West. And Edward West 
took all the early land grants and charted them on a map, on, on a series of maps. And the maps were printed on canvas. And those maps are here in the library um, that shows where the, all the early uh, land grants were. I have a set myself and I, in the midst of all my <coughs> archives, I can't find them. Uh, but anyway, there are, those, those exist. He did that. And he also wrote a book, which when I started doing Portsmouth history in, in the 1970s, uh, was the only book I could find that had much about it in Ports about Portsmouth in it. And it's all about Portsmouth. And one of the real valuable things in it is he lists all the people on the compact and a lot of the other early settlers and talks about where they went afterwards, which was kind of interesting. Anyway, that book's in the library here too. It's History of Portsmouth, 1638 to 1938. It's a small, thin volume, but, and it has a lot of the celebratory stuff that they did in 1936, when, again, when Rhode Island was celebrating. They had paving stones down at Founders Brook uh, for different families, which is kind of interesting. So, and there's a lot of stuff. The, the, gov the governor was there, the, the artillery was there, the all kinds of sort of ceremonial things that went on at that time all which is being surpassed by the 375th committee this year, however. <laughs> Much more. You wouldn't believe all the things that are coming up in this year, from this committee. Okay, so um, in late March, as best we can determine, nobody was keeping written records, by the way. Um, late March, the first settlers started building shelter down in the vicinity of the town pond. And, and again, they got their house lots. Some people, they really were literally living in holes in the ground in tents. This is March. And it was interesting to point this out this afternoon at the ceremony. I said, look outside. This is the kind of weather they were settling in. Uh, and any cover they could find. And, and actually, they were a little slow building houses. They were much more concerned about getting the land ready for farming. Okay, they came in by ship and, and had you know, lumber with them and everything else. Plus, they cut a lot of lumber from here. Um, but they began to build houses. Will Hutchinson was one of the first uh, to come in late March. Uh, and uh, Coddington came in April, and others who signed the compact came as, as late as at the first part of May. Okay. One thing perhaps I should mention, I, I neglected this when I was talking about the compact. There were 23 people who signed the compact. The last four have a line drawn through their names, through one line through the four names. And the, the, we don't know why whether they didn't come, but they did come. Uh, three of the four of them came in the first year. But why they were scratched out of the compact, I don't know. But anyway, so, you had some, so it was either 19 or 23 people signed the compact. Okay, those, those are the numbers. And of course, I, I neglected to mention this as well. The first name on the compact is, is William Coddington. The second name is the Reverend John Clark. The third name is Will Hutchinson. And I didn't have anything to do with it. Ann Hutchinson couldn't sign the compact. Again, that wasn't done. We had in, in our town, just let me digress for a minute, we had some signs in the town that used to say, birthplace of American democracy. I think that was a little bit of a stretch. Uh, again, uh, my, in my opinion, there were slaves here. Women had no rights to speak of. And if you had a visitor come to visit you in Portsmouth, you had to sign sign for them and pay for them as visitors. Not exactly my concept of democracy, but that's just an opinion. All history is an opinion. We have to realize that. Of course, everybody selects certain things and has certain biases. Anyway, by the 1st of May, things were, were coming together. Anne arrived in, in April. She had been told to get out of Boston by the end of March. Uh, she walked overland with some of her family, including little kids. Three, four, three and four years old, walked from Boston to uh, Providence, and then got on a boat and came down to Portsmouth. And uh, one other thing, uh, we also hear the term Pocasset as the name of the establishment. Pocasset was the Indian name for this area. And in particular, more than in Portsmouth, in, in sort of uh, Tiverton, across the bridges. That was Pocasset. And some of the early records say Pocasset, some of the town meeting records say Pocasset, but within a year or so after coming here, they changed the name to Portsmouth in order to acknowledge um, Portsmouth, England. That's where it come. So um, they, the settlers were beginning to arrive. Anne, Anne arrived 
And at, not long after she arrived, this is kind of one of those things that you see in somebody's journal. Um, there was an earthquake in the area. We have had earthquakes here. I can remember one off Little Compton about 1965, somewhere around there. Anyway, Governor Winthrop of Boston said that the earthquake was proof of God's continued disquietude against the existence of Anne Hutchinson. <laughs> hmm. He didn't like her very much. <laughs> okay, put on time-wise. Again, some of the compact signers did not come. Some never came. Uh, Thomas Savage was kind of interesting. This is really ironic as can be. Thomas Savage was Anne Hutchinson's son-in-law. Married one of her daughters. Yet he stayed in Boston. He never came to Portsmouth. And ultimately, he was elected governor of Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. That's really weird. Think about it. Sure, a few Massachusetts Bay governors rolled over in their graves when that happened. A number of others, including uh, Will Hutchinson's brother, Edward, came to Portsmouth very briefly and then went back to England uh, and, and stayed in England, lived there for another 30-some um, years. One of Anne Hutchinson's sons came to uh, Portsmouth but then went back to Boston and was allowed to, to stay there. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. The names on the compact are, are kind of interesting to follow and see um, what happened to some of them. And that, that's what Edward West's book does. It, he charts some of them. All right, now, the first recorded town meeting. Town meeting was the, the way we settled, the way we governed, okay? And Portsmouth was governed by a town meeting until, I don't know, when was the last one? About 1977 or somewhere around there. We had town meetings for a long time. What circuses they were. Uh, anyway, they set up town meetings originally, and in order to, to participate in the town meeting, you had to be a free man, in quotes. You had to be a free man. And in order to be a free man, you had, be, had to be accepted into the community by other free men. Okay? And again, it's free men. So the free men would have these meetings periodically, in, initially uh, every other week or so. And they would, uh, the first one was on the 13th of May, just soon after they got here. And we have records of that, uh, records of that town meeting. And Coddington was elected judge. Coddington, I neglected to mention this, when they signed the deed with Canonicus and, and Miantonomi, Coddington's name's on that deed. One other person, uh, Randall Holden, uh, but, and we're not sure what happened to him. <coughs> but again, Coddington was considered the person who executed the deed to buy the Aquidneck Island. So he was, he was the important man, and he was, he thought he was much more important than he was. Okay. He really was, uh, and, and some people feel he was kind of a dictator. Okay. Not terribly popular, but respected. I guess that's probably the way to say it. William Dyer was the clerk. The clerk is the secretary uh, who kept the records of the town meeting. And Dyer, uh, 12 people attended this meeting. They laid down the rules for freemen. How do you had to be accepted in order to stay here? And of course, you couldn't, you couldn't get land. You couldn't get a uh, farm unless you were a free man. But people came. Uh, I think it was about around 16, 1644, 1646, there were more people in Portsmouth than there were in Providence. Population of Portsmouth grew quite rapidly at this point. Again, really good farmland, as we experienced all the way through, to a certain extent even today, but certainly through World War II times. So they worked out land distribution problems. How much, uh, I think it was two or three shillings per acre, uh, that they charged for the land. And they set up this kind of interesting thing which has a long heritage. They set up a, a they put a fence across the northern tip of the island. And they referred that to that as the common fence. And the common fence was there, became the common fence point. And so what they did was to put all their sheep up there, fence it off, and you know, let them graze there in that area. Uh, one of the big things in the, in the first volume of Portsmouth Records that we have is earmarks. Earmarks for sheep, earmarks for cattle, uh, and so on. So they could keep track of whose was who. Anyway, they established this common fence point as a grazing area for a lot of the uh, sheep and, and cows later. 
They also establish a meeting house at the spring. The spring, again, is, is in the vicinity of the um, Founders Brook. That's where the spring was. There is a spring there, the brown uh, spread spring that uh, flows eventually into the town pond, although a lot of it uh, flows through uh, conduits and so on now. Goes right under Boys Lane. So a meeting house was planned at the spring. In addition, uh, William Ballston, one of the early settlers, was given the responsibility of building the, the first, what do they call it? I uh, can't think of the name of it, but it was sort of the, the first bar, if you will, uh, where he could, set, he, could, he could sell lively spirits. That's what it was called. Uh, anyway, that was an early decision, too. So at the first town meeting, right away, Coddington was chosen as the magistrate. These two terms are used interchangeably, magistrate and judge. Officially in the record, sometimes it says judge, other times it says magistrate. It means the same thing in terms of their society. It was the person who was in charge. Okay? And the town meeting form of government was established. That's a very important democratic condition. It would be more democratic if everybody could have participated. But it was democratic for the free men. But anyway, Coddington was really very important. And over time, over that first year, there came to be differences between the, four, the supporters of Coddington and the supporters of the Hutchinsons. Again, Will Hutchinson was the spokesman, the political spokesman, if you will, for his wife. Uh, and so there were Hutchinsonians and there were people who supported Coddington. Then we get this nutcase that arrives named Samuel Gordon. He was really strange. Samuel Gordon came and, and he believed in free everything, free uh, liberal civil ideas. And he got in the middle of this dispute and, and tended, I guess because of his outspokenness, tended to side more with the Hutchinsonians than he did with the supporters of Coddington. Uh, eventually, later on, he was brought to trial in Portsmouth for sedition or something and eventually was banished from Portsmouth and went on to established a colony in Warwick in 1643. But he's an interesting character too because he had gotten in trouble in Plymouth and, and I think, I don't, I'm not sure he ever was in, Bo if he was in Boston, he was thrown out of Boston too. So the split, what early historians refer to as the separation. Okay. One Rhode Island history by the name of Field says that the, what was set up in Portsmouth was a perfect democracy uh, there were political and religious differences that split the colony in the spring of 1639. Keep in mind, and I think this is important, when you consider the reasons why these people were chased out, in a lot of cases, um, you know, they would, they would establish a church someplace. There were no churches established in Portsmouth in that first year. Okay? There were no churches established here. And, and I'm not sure when the first one was. It probably was uh, quite a while later. So. With a certain amount of dissent going on, Coddington decided we need to change the government. So what we're going to do, instead of having just a judge, we're going to have a judge and three elders. And those are the people who are going to really matter. And <laughs> they would rule, as it says here, and this was the phrase that was used in the town meeting, they would rule according to the general rule of the word of God. Coddington's elected judge under the new government, and the elders were Nicholas Easton, John Cogshill, and William Brenton, all close supporters of Coddington. The Hutchinsonians were not happy about this, as you might imagine. They really were trying to see what they could do about getting rid of Coddington. So Gordon and the Hutchinsons sort of outflanked this leadership and, and brought up issues at town meetings. And um, the, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of tension political tension especially in the colony and the, the Coddington forces wanted more authority and the Hutchinsonians said they were too autocratic as it was and so the the supporters of Coddington decided to leave as I said many times and it's, it's kind of a, a it, it is a joke really 35 people in Portsmouth were too many so nine of them left <laughs> yeah. But in leaving, this is, they, let, they walked out of a town meeting. Here's, here's the setting. They're in a town meeting on uh, April 28th, 1639. Just about a year, almost exactly a year after they had arrived. And they walk out. Well, one of them that walks out with Coddington is William Dyer. Okay. I'll say more about that in a minute. But in, they decided they signed an agreement 
which could well be compact two. Okay? And this is what it said. It's agreed by us whose hands are underwritten to propagate a plantation, interesting word, in the midst of the island or elsewhere, and to engage ourselves to bear equal charges answerable to our strength and estates in common, and that our determination shall be by major voice of judge and elders, the judge to have a double voice. <laughs> There's a power move for you. So Coddington was ensuring his per perpetuity of, of his position. So eight people signed this agreement on the 28th of April, 1639, and left. Again, all these are familiar names if you look at anything in Newport. Nicholas Easton, John Cogshill, William Brenton, John Clark, Reverend John Clark, Jeremy Clark, Thomas Hazard, Henry Bull, and William Dyer. Okay, those were Coddington's followers who left. We saw today the first, the, the first book of Portsmouth Records, which started with the, the compact. In addition to that, there are a few other mentions of town meetings in Portsmouth after that. Then, all of a sudden, there are town meetings in Newport. What happened was, when this split occurred, Dyer, who was the clerk, the secretary, if you will, closed the book when the fight started, walked out, took the book with him including the Portsmouth Compact. Okay? And so, in spite of the fact that the first year of Portsmouth Town Meetings is in that book, it then goes right on into Newport Records. So the Secretary of State will never allow you know, Newport Records to be kept in Portsmouth. So, the, they just walked out of the meeting, again, with no minutes at all. Apparently it happened at the beginning of the meeting. So, the Newport Records are in the same book with the compact. There were other motivations for choosing Newport, and this hasn't been explored. Well, it's been explored by a, an interesting book that's called um, Fat Mutton and Liberty of Choice. And I'm trying to think of the author's name. Lippincott. Uh, he, not, not Bert, who is the librarian at the Newport Historical Society, but I think it's, his, it's probably his grandfather. It was, it was, the book was written in the 40s sometime. Fat Mutton and Liberty of Conscience, which deals with the sheep trade and uh, their, their liberty ideas. He goes in at great length in that book to talk about one of the major motivations for these people moving to Newport was economic. Newport had a, obviously a, a, a wonderful natural harbor. These people were merchants. They were farmers and merchants. They wanted to sell their goods. And they didn't want to sell them at the local you know, food fair. They wanted to sell them elsewhere, and they sold cattle, horses, uh, sheep, and farm produce a long distances away, as far away as the Caribbean. And that's the emergence of Newport as a major port. And Newport was a major port. By the 1750s, 60s, Newport is one of the five major ports of the British North America, along with Boston, Philadelphia, Charleston, South Carolina, and New York, and Newport. Those are the five. Uh, I'll jump ahead a little bit as another digression, but Newport was devastated by the Revolutionary War. It was occupied by the British for three years, and the British, when they left, after most of the people had left, they destroyed the wharves. They really beat up Newport. Okay? And then they tried to recover Newport the way it had been in the pre-Revolutionary War period. And then they got hit with uh, Jefferson's Embargo Act and all sorts of events that led up to the War of 1812 and it didn't recover. They, they were starting to recover and then they got slapped back again. I've made this point before and it's kind of a unique point of view and maybe you don't agree with this, but if that, I think that the British occupation of Newport ultimately was probably a good thing because can you imagine a Quidnick Island looking like Manhattan Island. Could have happened, okay? That's scary, that's really scary. But anyway, and Newport wasn't discovered really until the 1840s or so when people from, of all places, South Carolina decided they were gonna come to Newport to take in the airs, okay? And it became, started the resort business in Newport. Anyway, so these nine went to Newport. Again, I think it was, I think, again, I have, no great basis for research. I tend to agree the fact that this was more economic than political or, or social. They really were looking for a place where they could 
build wharves and so on. And, and most of the settlement in Newport was in the vicinity of the Wanton Lyman Hazard House, up away from, uh, there's a spring there, by the way, underneath Coffee's garage. Uh, and that might be restored. There are plans to possibly make that a park, as long as they can get the land. Um, and, uh, and Henry Bull's house was there, right behind the Wanton Lyman Hazard House until 1914, uh, when it was in a fire. I have an old postcard of that. It's really cool. Henry Bull was one of the people who went with uh, uh, Coddington. Anyway, so Dyer takes the town records, they establish Newport, and of course then you have the two communities that, that you know, work, work together or work apart together. Now the ones who stayed in Portsmouth wrote another document, Compact 3, okay, in which they said, we whose names are underwritten, and, and we have a copy of this, by the way, the original copy of it, the original document. And, 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 but we only have half the page down the middle, it's split. And so what's in italics here, or what's in brackets rather, is what one historian has assumed was there. So I'll just read the whole thing. We whose names are underwritten acknowledge ourselves the loyal subjects of His Majesty King Charles and in His, and, and in his name do bind ourselves into a civil body politic ascending under the laws according to the right and matter of justice. They're putting themselves under the king, which the original compact did not do. And the Mayflower Compact did. Okay. Kind of an interesting twist to see to the, to the whole story. We had, uh, our town clerk went to, along with Carol Zinno, Kathy and, and Carol Zinno went to the state archives last two weeks ago. And they wanted to see the compact. They actually wanted to get the compact back to Portsmouth and found out there were these difficulties that I just mentioned. But what they did get from the State Archives is a copy of the second book of Portsmouth Records, which start in May, April 30th, 1639. And one of the first things in that book is this document, signed by about 35 people, okay? none of whom were people who had gone with Coddington, obviously. Uh, and they decided to set up a government in Portsmouth, those who stayed behind, and they elected Will Hutchinson as their judge. So again, he was an important person, obviously his wife was as well. And there were only three people, Hutchinson, Hall, and Aspinwall, who signed the original compact and this one. Again, people scattered some. So they established a government here in Portsmouth, Acknowledging allegiance to the king, which is kind of an interesting twist to the whole story. Eventually, Newport and Portsmouth were united under the leadership of Coddington as the governor of the Quidnick Island of Portsmouth and Newport. And Will Hutchinson was a deputy governor for a year. And the best guess is that he, he only served a short time because his wife probably put a lot of pressure on him to forget associating with Coddington. <laughs> So they continue to fear absorption by the Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, until Roger Williams secured an independent uh, Rhode Island charter in 1644. And that charter is an important document in Rhode Island history. And then they decided to go one step further. They decided to go and get a new charter, a much more thorough charter of 1663. Roger Williams and John Clark went to do that. Williams didn't stay very long. He came back to Rhode Island. Clark stayed there for 13 years, trying to get Parliament to accept this <coughs> charter. And that charter guaranteed independence of religion, freedom of religion, and independence from all other colonies as well. <coughs> it's important to note that that charter of 1663 was written 350 years ago, this year. And it's on display in the State House uh, up in Boston, up in Providence. Okay. So it's a big anniversary for that as well. And that remained the, the, the constitution of the state, of the colony and state, later state, of Rhode Island until 1843, when Rhode Island actually sat down and wrote a constitution, which still governs the state with a whole bunch of amendments. <laughs> that document's important. Okay, just to conclude, a little bit about the later lives of some of these people I've been talking about. Eventually, by the way, just to finish up the other point, 
that government of Aquidneck Island got tied up with Warwick and Providence and eventually the colony kind of came together uh, as, a, as the colony of Rhode Island. William Coddington was around for a long time after he left Portsmouth. He was a wealthy merchant in Newport, very successful. His house was in the vicinity of the, um, uh, the Friends Meeting House in Newport. It lasted until 1823. I have a sketch of it, but not a, obviously not a photograph. There wasn't photography then. Um, he later became a Quaker. He became a Quaker like more than half the population of Rhode Island. 60% of the population of Rhode Island by about 1680 were Quakers. Yeah. You know, I, I was, that was the place to be. And he served for two terms as governor in late in his life, governor of the whole state. Uh, he was a politician all the way through. But he served two terms of governors and act as governor and died as governor in 1678. Again, 40 years after he came to Portsmouth. John Clark established the First Baptist Church in Newport, which still stands and still functions. He got the charter of 1663, which was no mean task, by the way. I mean, the idea of this guy from out there someplace trying to convince Parliament that they needed to support this document, uh, it was important. And, and again, he was a very strong advocate, and, and not uniquely so. Roger Williams very much believed in, in freedom of religion as well. But he's an important person in that whole concept, which ultimately got into the United States Constitution with the First Amendment. There's a burial ground for John Clark. I lived here for about 30 years before I knew where I was. There's a Coddington Cemetery, by the way, as well. The uh, burial ground for John Clark is on Marcus Wheatland Boulevard. There's a little section off. It's about a house lot, and his grave is, is there. Right next to Community Baptist. Pardon? Right next to Community Baptist Church. Yeah, right, right. Mm -hmm. Um, William Hutchison died in 1641, around there, we don't have an exact date. He was a merchant, he was a judge, he was the deputy governor, Anne Hutchinson's husband died in 1641. Some authorities say 1642. John Cogshill was the first president of the Rhode Island Colony, first big official, he was one of the early people who went to Newport. Henry Bull served two terms as governor, was the last survivor of the original settlers, lived till 1694. Uh, again, his house survived in Newport until a uh, fire took out a whole block uh, right behind the uh, Wanton Lyman Hazard House in 1914. And John Sanford also was governor of Newport and of Portsmouth later on. And of course, we can't stop without saying what happened to Anne Hutchinson. When Will died in, in 1641, she continued to fear that Massachusetts was going to come and get her. Uh, she was a strong-willed woman, but she still had that fear because, again, the people in Massachusetts kept saying they were going to do that. Uh, they were going to put her out of existence. And so she decided to move westward, way out west to the, the Pelham area of the Bronx. Now, at that time, the Dutch colony in Manhattan went about to 15th Street or so, okay, from the southern tip of Manhattan, just the, the tip of the, the island. But the Dutch claimed in New Netherlands, they claimed everything all the way up the Hudson River, okay, and they had all these estates along the Hudson River. Anyway, she moved into Dutch territory where she felt, you know, the, the British, uh, the, the Massachusetts people couldn't get her, all right. So, um, in, in the summer of 1642, with seven children, she moved to that area, again, of northern Bronx. The Dutch and Indians were in conflict with one another quite often. The Dutch were not exactly uh, friendly to the Indians. It was not exactly a, a Roger Williams situation. And the Sawanoi Indians attacked her settlement in the summer of 1643, and we don't know exactly what date, probably August sometime. And she and all of her family that were there, except one, uh, were massacred by the Indians. Okay. Uh, if, if you're familiar with that area at all, there's a, a famous split rock, which is in the middle of a expressway flying by back and forth. Uh, that's where it was. There is the Ann Hutchinson Parkway right there uh, in that vicinity as well. One daughter was out picking berries. I think it was Susanna, I think was the name. And, uh, she wasn't killed, but the Indians captured her 
and she went to live with them for nine years and left them with some reluctance when she was freed later on. And so uh, it, it's her and all the other Hutchinsons that were left in Boston and a few in Portsmouth that everybody's descended from. Last slide. The legacy of Anne Hutchinson. I think it's very important in local history. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an awkward thing to talk about. She was very important. But in terms of, you know, when we look at history, we look at who were the important politicians, how did things go in, in, you know, in that kind of sequence, military figures or political figures. We don't talk about somebody who was more socially uh, an activist, and, and she was. Again, a very outspoken woman in an age in which women had that, you know, the idea of essentially no rights. Their job was to cook the meals, clean the house, and, and so on. That lasted a little bit longer than Anne Hutchinson, by the way, and I'm sure some of you realize. Uh, but she suffered greatly for her outspokenness. Her trials were, were really dramatic scenes. It's really interesting to read in uh, Eve LaPlante's book, The American Jezebel, uh, and, and that's what one of the governors called her, by the way, I think it was Winthrop, um, that, uh, you know, how her trials went. And, and again, she very courageously spoke her views and, and admitted in her religious trial, admitted that those were her views. And of course, what the trial does then is say, well, you know those views are, are you know, in contrast to the accepted views. And uh, so she really had a really hard time with her trials. Plus, she was not in good health either um, during that time. So they came to Portsmouth and formed a new colony. And I think very much we should uh, honor her, not her exclusively, but honor her along with others because of their role that they played in establishing Portsmouth. She very much, there's no question about it, was a woman <coughs> ahead of her time, um, for sure. I mean, she really was uh, a unique individual in our society. And again, somebody that we really should honor. So I think it's, it's, it's a good occasion to do that. And, and I think, again, we have to uh, try to keep all of this whole story in perspective a little bit. I think that's my last slide. That is my last slide. Thank you. Now, these are two little girls we saw in Russia wearing American t-shirts. I thought that was really cool. <laughs> anyway, I will be happy to try to answer a few questions if you have them. And I will uh, ask you to speak up on your questions so everybody can hear them. And, uh, whoops. Anyway, and I'll try to repeat them if I figure you can't. Yes, back in the back. Uh, Jim, I'm interested in how the uh, uh, land bill was transferred by the uh, early settlers there and in terms of, you said they could buy some land, but who did they buy it from? Where did the money go to that they paid for? The common good. It went for defense. It went for uh, building meeting houses. Um, like our tax money is... In a way. Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah... So, Sure, and some of these people that came could afford a 200-acre farm, and some could afford three acres. So, I mean, it wasn't uh, an equal distribution. Uh, the people who signed the compact who came got a pretty good deal, though. When you think about, you know, uh, some of these land, the Freeborn Farm, for example, was, was all of uh, everything from Carnegie Abbey all the way down the Abbey property to Melville. I mean, that was one farm. I mean, that was a pretty good deal there. And, and somebody else had one all along Wapping Road that way. But anyway, yeah, that's, that's I think, what happened. Maggie? a free man? Acceptance by the other free men. Uh, in other words, you went to a town meeting, I, I'm applying to be a free man. Okay, what's your financial status? What's your, you know, probably what's your political beliefs or your religious beliefs? Uh, and they made a judgment on whether or not that person was acceptable to the rest of society. Did you have to own land or could you get land? It was easier to get it if you were a free man. Uh, otherwise, in, in a lot of cases, if you weren't a free man, you were urged to move on, keep on going, you know, unless you had... They, they could do that, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions? Yes? Um, we did have a great deal of slavery on Aquinnick Island. Yes, we did. Time, and I wondered if there was any type of slavery, did they have Indians as slaves at this time in the 17th century? I know that in the 19th century, mm -hmm. in the middle of the 19th century, there were quite a few slaves, yeah. many slaves on the Quinnick Island, especially yeah. in the war. 
Well, the, the, in, in the 18th century, the two leading ports for importing slaves into the United States in New England were Bristol and Newport. Okay. The Indians were not enslaved uh, in the 1630s, 40s. There was a pretty harmonious relationship. They, they dealt well with the Indians, again, guided by Roger Williams. Roger Williams was around until about 1678 or so, quite a while after the settlement. And he really kept things uh, harmonious with the Indians. It was not until 1675 when King Philip's War started uh, and that the, there was, as far as I can tell, any hostility between the Indians and the, and the local settlers. They got along really well. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure eventually there were Indians that were sla enslaved. There were Indians who, who you know, people got in trouble. Some of the town meeting records, somebody, I think it was Boston, one of the people who ran the, the bar, uh, got in trouble because he gave booze to an Indian who was found dead uh, along the shore. And the Indians weren't even supposed to be here. You know. So, I mean, there were situations like that, inc incidents like that. Brandy, Other you said the Indians were not supposed to be here? They, were, they agreed to leave the island. By the by, the winter of thirty eight, thirty nine. Yeah. Other questions? Anybody? No. Great. Good. I told it all. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you.